Uh, let me continue the, uh, uh, the debate with you, Mr. Elijah Enorku. Uh, we're talking about Africa uh, living from an exporter of raw materials to a pro producer, and we're looking at the possibility of these in uh, ensuring Africa's total uh, transformations. Uh, so the, the, the question now, because when I, when I listened uh, critically to, to, to you, the analysis, the holistic analysis uh, presented by yourself and uh, Mr. Patrick on this topic of discussion, we begin to want to understand uh, what actually is the problem is. And now we want to look at how Africans or African countries can reverse the economic trends uh, which have been existing or economic models which they actually inherited from the former uh, colonial masters which are still standing as impediment to the continent's uh, uh, total economic transformation in present day society. You know, when when you in, inherit something and you're still actually uh, very much into it, it, uh, it actually limits your perspective and how far you can go to, to make changes. So with all of this now being conversant uh, with uh, the fact that, of course, the economic policies existing in the days of colonialism and uh, which are still actually felt by some countries in Africa today uh, a hindrance to uh, continents, uh, political leaders and other economic stakeholders taking uh, some key economic decisions across the African continent that can push for this transformation. So in your perspective and a keen pundit uh, uh, as far as uh, Africa's uh, development is concerned, what are those policies that we can actually take in today's world, which, were, which will be very uh, uh, practical in bringing about economic buoyancy in Africa that will replace uh, uh, the uh, economic models existing in the days of the colonial masters, which we still see uh, some in today's world. Yes, yes, Clarice, what you've said is true, but I want to say that that's where, that is not where the problem is. The problem is in lack of leadership that can take the bull by the horns. I'll give an example down south here. We have a guy here, even though many people don't like him, called Donald Trump, he's not a friend of mine, but he did something which, you know, you can say, this needs, this is somebody that had the courage to do what is needed. When he came to power, he looked at NAFTA, NAFTA is North American Free Trade Agreement. And he thought the United States, which is a super juggernaut between, you know, when you compare to Canada where I live and Mexico, that's down south, it's a free trade agreement between these three countries. He said the United States was being cheated. We are like, you know, in terms of economic um, power and GDP and everything, they were like almost two thirds of the whole uh, NAFTA zone. So he said that has to be renegotiated. That was not possible. It wasn't fair to the United States. Canada made noise and uh, Mexico made noise. No, these are trade agreements. You can't do the, can't do that. We have to go to WTO, World Trade Organization, to litigate this and all this. He stood his ground. And when he stood his ground, what happens? Because Canada is very dependent. You know, Canada is almost like the United States. I don't see any reason why there are even two different countries because the borders are you know, walking back and forth in between the two. And the economies are interwoven. What happens down here is the same thing that happens here. It's the same economy and the same people. But because of that, the same thing with Mexico. They have to come to the table and say, look, we know that this guy is a bully. We know that this guy is this. But at the end of the day, they had to agree to a renegotiation of the terms of NAFTA. And he got what he wanted because he holds the knife and holds the yarn. That is what Africa needs to do. It doesn't matter that Cameroon, Niger, or all these French countries sign a so nonsense agreement with France and say that. France has to be done to exploit the resources of this country. And if France is not able to exploit the resources of this country, that's when a third country can come in. Those countries can call that BS and say, we need to negotiate this again. This was negotiated in the time of colonization. We are no more colonized. We are independent. We want to renegotiate in terms of these arguments. 
like I gave you an example, that's what the president of Botswana did. His predecessor had got all these deals with all these companies, and when he came to power, he saw that they were unfair to the country. The country holds the knife on the young because that's where the resources are coming from. You're not going to be begging for the person who is supposed to come and exploit from you. You are the one that holds the upper hand. You dictate the terms of that agreement. That is what African countries are supposed to do. They are supposed to stand their grounds. Like my colleague said, one of the problems we find in Africa is this divide and rule. Africa is not united. If we have an African platform that takes care of all these trade agreements and say, look at the terms of agreement that Nairobi, Kina, and Faso, or whatsoever is going into, these terms of agreement do not favor Africa, do not favor this country. And these need to be renegotiated. If Cameroon is doing the same thing, Nigeria is doing the same thing, Burkina Faso is doing the same thing, Niger with its uranium, with France stands its ground, all the African countries stand its ground. There's no Western power, even this state that will come down, we're going to wipe out the whole of Africa because they're not agreeing with the terms of agreement because they see unity in purpose, they will come to the table and negotiate. The problem is that we don't have courageous leaders in Africa in the likes of Paul Kagame, Yubura Yusuveni, William Roto, Ramaphosa, and Ernest Malema in South Africa. We don't have leaders that can you know, come together and create a platform to turn Western hegemony on the resources of Africa. That's where the problem is. If we have leaders like that, I'm telling you, it is doable. How is it possible that a landlocked country like Rwanda, that does not have resource like the rest of the country, is able to innovate and come to a point where Western powers are now referencing Rwanda as an economic model to be emulated by other countries? How is it possible? You need a leader with that foresight, a leader that can stand up and say, this is what we are doing, and this is what we are going to do. Because some of these leaders, Clarice, let me tell you some of these leaders, I don't know how they think. Because if you look only at the increased revenue, because Africa is cash trap. They're going to the uh, Britain Wood Institution, Borman. Africa is cash trap. But within their nose, they have the means to come out from these economic doldrums. If you look at the value addition that transformation of raw material is going to add to the revenue of African economies, oh my goodness. Why can't they take advantage of this opportunity? Because commodity prices fluctuate when it comes to cash cross commodity. But the price of, you know, finished product does not fluctuate that much in terms of commodity prices. So you're dealing with gold, you're dealing with raw gold, you're dealing with iron ore, you're dealing with this. Look at the prices in the world market. They are zigzag up and down. But look at the prices of, i just give an example. I gave an example a while ago. Look at the price of chocolate in the world market. You don't find it going up and down. So the economies of these countries are going to be stable when they start dealing with semi-finished products instead of raw materials where you have that fluctuation in the economy. Not only that, look at transfer of technology. Let's just say here that we step, you know, look at the case of Niger, for example. Niger is in war now, and France is threatening to, to, to attack because of what they're getting in terms of uranium. If Niger had the technological know-how to even transform that uranium into intermediate, I'm not talking about finished product, into an intermediate product, they have the leeway to get rid of France, get rid of any other country, and sell that product to any other country that is ready to buy finished finish product in war. So, whether you look at it from an economic angle, you look at it from a technological angle, you look at it from a revenue generation angle, or you look at it from just diversification of the economy, an economy that's not dependent on raw materials, these transporting these, economy that has both the technological know-how, the raw materials, the knowledge that it needs in order to avoid the shocks in the world. We just went through COVID. African countries were begging for food to eat. Can you imagine? Begging for food to eat because the economy is so dependent on these raw materials. We do not have the technological know how to have semi finished products that can withstand the shocks in the economy. That is where we are today. So, to answer your question, African leaders need to stand their ground and 
Chance of even all those colonial, whatever it is, and say, we went into agreement with France, went into agreement with this. Those were colonial era. We are normally in the colonial era to say, it must be this country that must exploit our products. No, we can renegotiate the terms of those agreements and start afresh. In detail, Mr. Elijah Inoroku, I will come back to you subsequently uh, for us to develop further that uh, aspect which we, you just highlighted, uh, the aspect of uh, uh, maybe uh, poor leadership across Africa, the fact that Africa is still 